Um, face ID, yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Muma, who is not here this evening, but uh, her support, and uh, Mr. Neil Johnson and Ms. Stephanie Hall, um, Mel Robinson for the amazing design, um, our amazing coordinators, uh, Max Hackert and Carolyn uh, Clements, uh, Jen, of course, but most of all, I guess, the senior class of 2021 for helping turn my job into my own passion. So I really, truly want to thank all the students. And with that, I want to turn this over to Max and Carolyn um, and the 2021 Project Captivate. I just want to say thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, so welcome. Um, my name is Max Hackard. I'm the president of Project Activate this year. And my name is Carolyn Harmon, and I am the vice president of Project Activate. So again, I just want to say I'm very grateful that you guys are here. I've spent months working on this. So I appreciate you guys being here, and I hope you enjoy your night. Um, Carolyn has a quick announcement before we get started. <laughs> it's a United Nations organization dedicated to giving girls equal education opportunities across the world. It's a really important uh, organization to both Max and I because it's actually what empowered us to speak at Project Captivate my freshman and first sophomore year. So a little bit about Girl Up, it empowers women across the country. It specifically goes, its main goal is to donate and help empower women to seize their education in less developed countries. It thinks about how when you teach the young women in a less developed country, as I'm learning in economics, it actually further develops a nation and helps these countries become further developed. And it also empowers young women across the globe, just like it impacted Max and I. It gets us passionate about an issue and allows us to make an impact. So to express our gratitude for this organization, we are donating all our profits to them, and we encourage you to donate. So thank you so much for your time, and here is Improv. which we will take one of your fantastic and hopefully eventful days and make it a scene.
Kevin K. Algebra 2. Algebra 2 as a kid. They were. They had. They had no, like they had individual work time, but instead yeah. they used Instagram and Facebook. And they went on the Facebook. Whatever the kids do these the days. Yes. Um, I have a question, real quick. During their time, what did you do since they were doing their own thing? You have your IB class, A and A or A and I. A and A. Oh, it's okay. It's the difficult one. Okay. Um, and you tell us about complex numbers, yes. which are numbers with words. Yes. Which, yeah, yeah, that's right. And then, <laughs> right. And then you went to happy hour, which is book club for adults. <laughs> yeah. And then you came to the wonderful Project Capway that we have. Here. in the morning. Oh, it's 6.30 in the morning. Okay. Time to teach children, Andre. <laughs> Go take that shower. All right. All right, children of Algebra 2 class. Differential, 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 differential equations. equations. Here you can see some differential equations. <laughs> see some differential equations. They look very differential. Ah, that's <laughs> Numbers, some equations you all understand. Super interesting, I know, right? I can't tell if this is interesting or not. I wish I was on Facebook. <laughs> like it's out for two class. Oh, yeah. Mr. Oh, honey, um, do you want a mic? I mean, like, I don't think you need it. I'm not liking this very much, but. Sure. Thank you so much. Now you guys can hear my differential equations thing <laughs> so much better. Are you guys enjoying these differential equations? So are they the same equations or are they different? Oh, they're all the same. Exact same equation. It's so interesting, I know. Alright, next up. Ring, 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 ring. Oh, yeah. That's the bell. That's the bell. <laughs> so to keep things interesting, I decided to move my desk over here this time. Uh, you all got some free work, so. Are you I'm sorry, did you say something? Are you guys going on the Facebook? You guys going on the Facebooks right now? Yeah. Facebook? But I gave you equations, differential equations, so interesting. I use MySpace. Yes, I'm that is actually paying attention. Differential equations was in our class. I don't remember anything we learned this week. Oh. <laughs> yes, other students. What's the Wi Fi password? Well, that's a really good question. Oh, bitch. Yeah. Oh. Bring, 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 bring. Oh, the next class. My IB students. Yes, we're going to learn about complex numbers. That sounds complex. Guys, every class, I decided to move my desk back and forth. Keep it interesting, you know? Oh, uh, so important. So proper, except for, except for this person in the middle with the flower shirt. I love math. Let's sit in Socratic seminar formation. Of course, that's what. Hit two I birds in one stone, right, guys? <laughs> All right. So here are my complex numbers, sort of numbers, but worse in every way possible. So you see, this number plus x equals this number. Yes. Questions. Are they complex? <laughs> yes, that's what we're learning. <laughs> yes, other students. Mr. Rouhani, I don't believe that numbers can be bad. They're all beautiful. Uh, very good point. Actually, building off of Rowan's point, um, I think that we should respect all numbers, and I think that we should, yeah, actually, I respectfully disagree with your point based on the fact that numbers are not all equal. Guys, these are just numbers. Letters should not exist in numbers. Oh. Building off of Isabella's point, I agree. Oh, uh, well. What happened to that, Rohani? <laughs> Why are there letters in math? This is why complex numbers are worse. Because there's letters in them. Add happy hour. <laughs> oh, such a long day. My god. I'm gonna drink my, my soda with no vodka in it. Do you have a drink <laughs> right after this? Oh, this is my right to book club of fans. I thought we were reading Diary of a Wicked Kid. I was just reading my hamburger. <laughs> Guys, I'm just trying to have fun at Cheesecake Factory right now. <laughs> Can I have a bite of your burger? Thanks. Andre, I know you've always been a dumb fan, not a Pride and Prejudice fan, but you've got to tackle the program. I, I'm a math teacher. I just do math. <laughs> I read complex numbers. Math with letters? Next. Yeah, absolutely. Like, it, at least bring like a burger for everyone. 
next time, man. I don't know. I'm like, yeah, they make them here. <laughs> this is cheesecake fact. They have like 20 different genres of food. You can have anything you want. Take your soda thing. Why? To get my children. My soda with no vodka and too much lemon. <laughs> well, guess I'm gonna go to Project Captivate. Ah, Project Captivate. <laughs> So yeah, you're right. These circles, of course, with the exception of color, are exactly identical. So I want to, so I want you guys to ask yourself, why? Why did you allow yourself to be manipulated so very easily? Because think about it. I'm looking around the room. I'm seeing some familiar faces, but a majority of you, I don't. We've never had a conversation. We've never met. And quite frankly, I didn't know you existed until tonight, and you didn't know I existed until tonight. So, to each other, we're complete strangers. And so I want to ask you, why did you allow a stranger to so very easily manipulate you? Is it because I'm dressed nice? Is it because I'm holding a microphone and I have a fancy PowerPoint? Is it because I'm speaking at Project Captivate? And ladies and gentlemen, that's tonight's big question. Why? So let's follow this circle story, shall we? Say there's a small child. And every day for, I don't know, let's say 10 years. Every day for 10 years, I tell this child that the blue circle is bigger. 365 day, every single day for 10 years, the blue circle is bigger. Now the funny thing with this is that if we repeat something enough times, it becomes the truth. No matter whether it is true or false, repetition is the ultimate way to knowing. So of course this child is going to know and believe that the blue circle is bigger. But the problem is, is that if you were to ever ask the child why, or to ask them to give a reason, they would never be able to because they would have never deemed one necessary. Now, of course, the lessons that we learn in childhood, and even in adulthood, they stick with us for the rest of our lives. So, of course, this child, one day, is eventually going to grow up. And this child is now an adult. And the adult has kids. And so, of course, what we learn as children, we pass on, or sorry, what we learn as adults, we pass on to our children. And so, of course, the children are now in belief that the blue circle is bigger. And they pass it on to their children. And then their children pass it on to the friends 
the family, the aunts, the uncles, the teachers, every single person in existence until the lie has become embedded in the culture of the people. Now with this, what were to happen if there was another child who was subject to the same 10 years of conditioning, except this time they were conditioned to think that the red circle is bigger. So let's say that there's a town, and there are, let's say, a thousand, a thousand blue circle believers live in this town, and they all have the same opinion. They all think the same thing. They all believe the same thing. It's paradise to them. It's a heaven because they all agree on the same thing and there is no disagreement. And one day, out of the blue, haha, uh -huh. thanks guys, uh, comes, the, <laughs> comes the red circle believer. And he waltzes into the town, no one really bats an eye, he's not causing too much of a fuss. They realize he's there, but they're kind of like, eh, whatever. And so the red circle believer goes to the town square and he sets up a podium, much like this. And he begins to preach. He begins to preach, saying, the red circle is bigger, the red circle is better, all the blue circle believers are wrong. Now I'm just going to break up the story for a moment. If you have an opinion in anything, no matter how much you believe in it, whether it be very minimal or you believe it with your full heart, and someone proceeds to present an opinion directly opposite to yours, it's going to piss you off. Now, to the level at which it does so, depends on your ability to control your emotions and the situation, a lot of extraneous variables, but it's going to frustrate you even in the slightest. So of course, when the blue circle believers see that there's this red circle believer preaching and saying that they're all wrong, they're going to be furious. And remember, there's a thousand of them. So of course, the masses are going to be very angry. The collective is going to think that the red circle believer is corrupting society. He's attacking their culture. He's brainwashing their children. And he's an abomination to this world. And so out of impulse, what do they decide to do? They kill him. That's not funny. Notice in the story that they were missing tonight's key question. Why? 1,000 Blue Circle believers, and not one of them stopped to ask, why are we doing this? Why should he deserve to die? Why does he believe this? Why is he telling us that we're wrong? Why are we getting angry? And while this is, you know, just a silly little anecdote, this Project Captivate speech, it's upsetting and quite horrifying how common an event like this occurs in modern day society. Okay, so I'm going to take a wild guess and assume we've all been in a grocery store, am I correct? No. Okay, thank you for your responses, guys. So we've all been in a grocery store, we've all been down the dairy aisle, and we've all seen yogurt. Now, on every yogurt container, there's a little box on the front of the package, you know, big, bold letters. It says how much protein is in it. And ladies and gentlemen, we once again ask, why? Why does it have the protein of the yogurt listed right on the front of the label? It goes back to conditioning. From a young age, we are conditioned to know that protein is healthy. And being healthy is good. And so we have that connection. And with that connection, we fail to see the bigger picture. So let's say, I don't know, this yogurt has 20 grams of protein. You go up this shelf, and you see how much protein is in the yogurt, and you take it off, and oh, 20 grams of protein, that's fantastic. So what do you go ahead and do? You go ahead and you buy 10 of them. And so you go home, you open the yogurt, start eating it, and you finish it, and you feel good about yourself. You're like, yeah, I just consumed 20 grams of protein. I feel good about myself. Feeling healthy, feeling good. See, the problem with this is, though, remember how I said that we failed to see the big picture? Because while this yogurt has 20 grams of protein, did you bother to look at all the nutrition facts? Did you bother to look at the back of the label? Did you bother to see that this yogurt, while having 20 grams of protein, also has 75 grams of sugar, arguably making it worse than a Coke or a Pepsi. And so ladies and gentlemen, let's ask why. Humans don't like to think. We don't. We like things to be easy, simplistic, don't want to put a lot of effort into a lot of things. So of course, when we see that protein on the yogurt, we immediately make that connection. 
Protein, healthy, healthy, good. And then everything flies out the window because we've been conditioned to think this way. And so the only way to get around this is to think outside the box, and unfortunately not enough people do this. So once again, we must always ask, why? Take our technology. Phones, watches, computers, smart home devices. They have more control over our lives than we can give credit or believe. All of these devices, they all have microphones. And so, I don't know if this is news to you or not, but they listen in on our conversations. All the time. You ever wonder why one day you're talking with your buddy Jerry about dog toys? And you're like, Jerry, I'm going to get my dog toys. And he's like, yeah, it's a really good, it's a really good thing to do. Pet Smart has a good sale. And you're like, oh, sweet. Go to bed. Next morning, you wake up. Open your phone. Open Google. Oh, an ad for dog toys, specifically Pet Smart, 40% off. Don't get me wrong, that's really cool, but is anyone else absolutely terrified of that? And think about it, it's not just listening in on our conversations. These devices track where we go online, they track what we see, and they track us wherever we are on planet Earth. So all of you that have a smartphone here tonight, whatever database that that information is stored in, they know you are here. And so, ladies and gentlemen, let's ask, why? Specifically, why did we allow this to happen? Well, I don't know if you all are familiar with a little legal document. It's called the Terms and Conditions. And those things are boring. They are so very boring. They're long. They're filled with big words. They grab your shows and going to understand. And a lot of legal clauses that you just don't want to bother to look up because it takes too much time. Now, remember how I said that humans don't want to put a lot of effort into things? The terms and conditions of anything is usually what stands in our way of entertainment. We want instant entertainment, we want instant gratification, so we immediately try and go from point A to entertainment as fast as possible. And the only thing that ever stands in our way is the terms and conditions. So, honestly, I'm, I'm curious, I'm not, so this wasn't scripted, how many of you have actually read at least one terms and conditions in your life? Okay, so that, yeah, okay, so it's just about expected, you know, good on you guys. But yeah, I tried reading one, I, I, I fell asleep about five minutes in. The problem is, is that anything you load it into, Facebook, Netflix, Hulu, HBO Max, Disney+, Plus, Snapchat, Instagram, MySpace, all of it, all of it has terms and conditions, and what's scary is that we're forced to agree to it, because technically these companies and corporations can write whatever they want in these terms and conditions, force us to agree to it, and we blindly oblige because it's the only thing standing in our way of entertainment. And the worst part about this is that when we do this, we give them the knowledge, our most dangerous weapon, to distract us and to blind us. Because while these corporations are involved in sweatshops, child labor, and six-year-old peanuts to manufacture CPUs, international sex trafficking, I could go on and on. We're so distracted by the fact that Kylie Jenner got a breast job, or the fact that the Queen of England drinks four cocktails a day, that we don't even turn an eye, because to us, it does not seem like relevant information. So ladies and gentlemen, what are we gonna ask? Why? The overarching issue I'm trying to reach here is, is the problem with the truth. People don't like the truth. I do not care who you are, you don't, you don't like the truth. I don't like the truth, you don't like the truth. There are times where we can't accept it, but a majority of the time, it's hard. Because again, the truth of life is to be successful in anything, you have to work hard. It doesn't matter what it is, you have to work hard. You see these businessmen and women on TV, Four Lamborghinis, three summer homes, private jet, their own basketball team, sounds like the life. And all they started was a little, they started in a little shack in Tennessee. See, the problem is though, once again, you don't see the big picture. You don't see that middle ground. See, because there are people out there who are sitting on their couch eating chips, watching these businessmen and women live out their dreams, 
saying to the guy, yeah, I can do that. And then they think they can do it, and they start formulating their minds, and then one day they come across the realization of the truth, the truth that these businessmen and women are hustling 80 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, for five straight years. And I'm gonna be real, when you hear that, man, just all ambition flies out the window because that is a lot of hard work. And the few people that are successful are hungry enough to achieve that. Think about it, this all goes back to instant gratification. We want that instant entertainment, which is why we regress into that cycle of the nine to five, 40 hours a week, two weeks vacation, minimum wage paycheck. It's quite depressing. The problem with this, all this is, in my opinion, is that we've neglected our curiosity and wonder complexes for far too long. I guarantee you, if you were to walk in a class of kindergartners, they would immediately bombard you with questions. And they wouldn't be complex, they'd be simple questions. Why is the sky blue? How big is the ocean? Where do birds come from? How many stars are there in the sky? Simple questions like this, which I, realistically to us with, you know, more age, we find insulting. But when you think about it, these questions are coming from human beings that are genuinely interested in learning. Human beings that want to acquire knowledge. Human beings that actually believe that there is good in the world and that they can re truly do whatever they want. And what's sad is I think this wonder and curiosity complex is stripped somewhere along the path of childhood development. Because I guarantee you, if you were to walk into any classroom in this school and you sat down, crickets, there would be no excitement, no joy, no wonder, no curiosity, no crazy outlandish questions. Because, no offense, Mr. Rohani, I, I, I assume people learning about complex numbers must be quite perverted. Or at least that's the way they find it. Because coming to school has become a burden. We don't want to be here. We're not interested in learning. We don't want to put in the hard work. We don't want to put in the hard work because that's the truth. And the truth does not exist in our fantasies. It does not exist in our worlds of make-believe. And that's why we stay in these make-believe worlds. So we can neglect everything. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be real with you. I really do not care if you've been listening. I don't really care if you have any intention. I don't care if you're just here for support. So you can say, it's like, yeah, I was here, good job. But in this next little bit, I, I ask for full attention, please. Society has been moxed to ridiculing and outcasting those who are brave enough to ask questions, those who have the courage to stand up, those who want to know the truth, those who are willing to be vulnerable enough to not only acknowledge the truth, but accept it and live with it. And so right now in this auditorium, we're in our own little bubble of reality. It's just us. You are here in the present moment. And in this present moment, I want you to clear your mind and I want you to think. Because eventually this will be over. And eventually you're going to walk out those auditorium doors, back to the parking lot, back to reality, and back to your lives. But I want you to do me a favor when you leave this event tonight. Because you're going to leave this event tonight as people with new experiences and hopefully new knowledge. And with this knowledge, I want you to be curious again. I want you to wonder because while you have been conditioned to neglect the knowledge and neglect the wonder, it's never gone anywhere. It has always been there. And it will never go anywhere. And no one, no one can take that from you. So ladies and gentlemen, when you walk out those doors tonight, I want you to look up into the sky. I want you to look at the stars, mountains, City of Phoenix, I want you to embrace all of your surroundings and maybe, I don't know, 10 seconds, that's all it takes. Exist in the moment. Let the curiosity and the wonder of life flow 
over you. Let it consume you. It's okay. It will not hurt. And you will feel better than you did. And so when you walk out these doors, just be silent. Take in your surroundings. And I want your first word to be a question. And that question is why. Thank you. What an excellent performance. Um, thank you. And now for our next speaker is Sierra Johnson, and she's going to be asking how, what, and why consciousness exists. So here she is. Humans are, given our current explanatory abilities and theories, conceptually incapable of comprehending how consciousness has come into existence. So understanding the function of conscious thought is fairly straightforward for social coordination, for freedom of will, motivation, lots of different purposes. But the question of truly what and how we are able to think in the complex way that humans do is just out of reach of what we can rationalize. It can be summed up as biology, evolution, you can throw any number of words to describe how bodies of solid matter can experience so many complicated emotions and cognitive processes. But no explanation can fully encapsulate the connection between our physical and mental states. This limitation is called the explanatory gap. Before we begin to investigate how we can use biology and philosophy to understand consciousness, we have to first establish that the explanatory gap prevents humans from truly understanding what consciousness is. Instead, I'm going to talk about a few different topics that will help us become more familiar with how it works and what defines a conscious mind. Starting with something called the dynamic core. So the dynamic core involves the neural activity in the brain and how it relates to the idea of consciousness. As you exercise your mind, an incredibly complicated, unique set of neural signals are emitted by the brain and it evokes a specific pattern of responses. But how does this work? So in mammals, there's something called the thalamus and the cerebral cortex, and they contribute to consciousness. So the thalamus is positioned above the brainstem and between the midbrain and cerebral cortex, and it plays a role of sensory functions such as visual and auditory systems, along with memories, emotions, and motor activity. And if you're unfamiliar with motor activity, it's, it involves speed, strength, and kind of movement. So the thalamic interlaminar nuclei or the neurons in the thalamus have all these things called axons that connect the different parts of the brain. So if you're unfamiliar with axons are, you know in movies when like the, the screen pans into the character's brain and you see all this weird webbing. It kind of looks like lightning or branches and it's just zooming through this person's mind. Those are axons. So moving on to the cerebral cortex, this is the structure, it's the outer layer uh, above the cerebrum. Now, its responsibilities include stuff like perception, awareness. Um, I'm going to dive into those topics later in the speech. Um, also including memories and decision making. What's really interesting is that using modern science and brain imaging technology, scientists can actually uh, decipher the level of consciousness in a subject's brain by assessing and analyzing this neural activity in the thalamus and uh, cerebral cortex. What's also really interesting is that if a brain uh, is damaged in a way that hurts stuff like the hippocampus, the hippocampus or the cerebellum, a subject can still retain consciousness. However, if the thalamus or the cerebral, the cerebral cortex is damaged, these axons in the mind are disrupted. Therefore, the brain can no longer carry out these functions such as perception and awareness, and the subject can lose their state of consciousness. So continuing on with the neural activity, there's something called neural Darwinism, um, which was created by a man named Joel Edelman. So this is a theory that kind of explains the foundation of how neural activity results in consciousness. So it's divided into three sections, starting first with developmental selection. Uh, there's this phrase in neuroscience that reads, neurons that fire together, wire together. And it means the more you exercise your con cognitive abilities, and thoughts, the more your brain remembers which neurons to trigger and fire in order to cause these experiences and behaviors. 
Think like practice makes perfect. The more you practice, the better your brain will be at firing the correct neurons. So second is the experiential selection. And that involves changes and in developing your synaptic strain to cause unique individual experiences. So you're probably wondering what synaptic strength is. Basically, um, oh my gosh, I can't remember what synaptic strength is. It's the amount of excursion it takes for one neuron to send an electrical or mechanical signal to another neuron. The final part of neural Darwinism is re-entry, and that focuses on actually making the connections between the experiences in your head. So just to repeat, first part is development selection. That has to do with uh, how uh, practice makes perfect. The second part is experiential selection, and that involves uh, synaptic strength, actually like strengthening, strengthening and developing your brain to make these connections. And the entry is making those physical connections between individual experiences. Now all these help um, bring consciousness into existence. So moving on to a more philosophical part of consciousness is something called the higher order theories. I absolutely love these because they're super simple and a lot of stuff in consciousness is really complicated, but this is just a two-step test to determine whether or not an organism can be defined as conscious. So first, I want everyone in the audience to have some kind of observation, some kind of thought, think of anything. I need to think of how, thankfully, I pronounced Thalamus correctly because Carolyn Clements was making fun of me all during economics today that I was saying Thalamus, which is incorrect. So second, this thought must be shadowed by a higher order state. And a higher order state is a subconscious system that shadows your initial thought, and basically recognizing that your thoughts are existing and real. So that sounds confusing. So picture yourself in a room, and kind of your soul floating above your body, watching yourself think, being aware that you're thinking. So the ability to recognize your own mental state uh, fulfills the second requirement. So take a rock. A rock can't think, it already fails the first requirement, but take something like a robot. A robot can have a function, a purpose. It can have a, a job, a requirement to fulfill. Maybe like a robot that assembles a machine. It has these thoughts in its mind, however, it's not aware of itself thinking. It's not aware of its mental state, therefore it fails the second requirement. Because all of you are aware that you're currently thinking, you are being conscious. But take something like a dog. A dog can have thoughts and observations, but we're unaware of whether or not they're aware of themselves and aware of their own mental state and thinking. Therefore, we can't define them as conscious. So this goes into something called propositional attitudes. So propositional attitudes are pretty self-explanatory. It's basically an attitude you have about a proposition. Take the statement, Sierra's wearing heels. To make this a propositional attitude, I can say, I'm wearing five seven. Why am I wearing heels? What, what is being five nine doing for me? Why, why am I wearing heels? That is a propositional attitude. I added my own personal opinion or belief into the statement. And because of that, that satisfies the second requirement of the higher order theories test. So you can use both propositional, and, propositional attitudes and the higher order theories test to uh, the, the figure out whether or not an organism can be conscious, called conscious. So next, I'm going to um, describe some of the properties of consciousness so we can kind of understand better what it consists of. First, we're going to talk about cognition. So I'm going to tell you a quick fact. That did you know that the milk of hippopotamuses is pink? Like, like bright pink. It's crazy. Yeah. What? What? It's crazy. You can Google it. I, I'm not lying to you. Um, so you're exercising cognition right now because I just told you some new information and you're going to retain that. And the act of absorbing new information is cognition. Next is perception. Okay, so uh, I told Max Hacker that she draws her eyebrows on too high and she wouldn't be surprised. Yep, yep, no laughs. Okay, so. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rob. Me perceiving that no one laughed makes me think that I'm not funny and I should stop telling jokes. So being able to recognize my surroundings and change my behavior according to how people are reacting is perception. So there's other properties like decision making, morality and ethics, and also memory. And Sigmund Freud has a really interesting 
theory about memory and how it relates to consciousness. So he has three levels to consciousness and memory, starting first with conscious. So these are like the, the thoughts, the feelings, um, observations about the environment that, were, that are current in our mind, that are presently ha happening. We're currently thinking of these things. Next is the pre-conscious. These are the thoughts and feelings and emotions that we have the potential to acknowledge but aren't currently present and happening. So think of your favorite flavor of ice cream. Mine being salt and caramel. So that information was in the pre-conscious, but once I ask that question, it's now in the conscious. You're now thinking about your favorite flavor of ice cream. Um, and the final stage is the unconscious. So this is all the feelings, the observations, the emotions that are really deep down in our mind. And that if I ask you a question about it, you probably won't be able to retrieve that memory, that thought. So this includes like trauma, whatever we learned in calculus today. That's all in the unconscious. You guys not a calculus fan? Okay. Maybe not. So this, all these three categories help represent how the consciousness works, um, different levels of memory in our mind, and all this contributes to the definition of consciousness. So I kind of introduced a lot of information today, so I'm going to quickly review everything that we talked about. First is the explanatory gap, the limitation that we as humans cannot fully perceive, understand what consciousness is, just because our brains aren't equipped that way. They're, we were not built and born to understand the idea of consciousness. Second, we've got the uh, thalamus and the uh, cerebral cortex, the different uh, structures in the brain that help us, that, that explains how consciousness works, and how it relates to human mapping. Um, moving from that, we have the higher order state, and that process, that two step process of determining whether or not a subject can be, de can be uh, defined as conscious. Oh, we also have the different properties of consciousness. We have perception, we have cognition, we have memory, and Freud's three levels of memory, the conscious, the pre-conscious, and the unconscious. Okay, but personally, I think that the explanatory gap is completely false. I have my own definition of consciousness. And I just want to say that the, the, the real, what, what consciousness really is, it's a... Oh, I'm out of time, guys. Sorry, I'm out of time. I hope you guys are going to have to change. I hope you guys are going to mind works. And thank you for listening. lovely um, presentation. Um, it's about transportation and suburbia, which are two interesting topics we will come to learn. So thank you so much, and on to David. Suburbs. We know them a little too well, I'd argue, in America. But I hate them um, a lot. <laughs> and suburbs are one of those things, one of those pictures of our lives that most people don't jump to when you think of something that you just so vehemently oppose. And I mean, what about them is not offensive to me? That's a great question. Um, to be honest, I don't fully know off the top of my head. But this way of life, this way that our entire country has been built, is terrible in so many ways, more than I think anyone really can wrap their head around. This little collage here, um, really fun assortment of pictures, I think so perfectly encapsulates what I hate about suburbs. Um, <laughs> you have this ridiculous maze of streets, little weaving dashes, it looks like a termite colony. You ever see like a log and you see where the ants have gone through, um, come up with these little tunnels? That's what that looks like. Suburbs are the worst way that we could have possibly constructed an entire nation. Um, 
I think Phoenix is a great example of that. You have this terrible, terrible suburban sprawl. I mean, for how many people live in Phoenix? It's around five million for the entire metro area. We take up so much land in such a ridiculous amount of space, all for this terrible assortment. We have little cul-de-sacs and this inefficient designation of space. I mean, it's such a loose concentration of people. It's probably the worst mistake an urban planner could have possibly made. I mean, and I can go on about this for a while. Um, <laughs> it's not a very difficult thing for me to hate on, but why, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty irrational, right? Like, out of any issue facing this country, why suburbs? You know, there's problems with healthcare, um, commonly contentious immigration issues, all that good stuff. And I mean, I have opinions on that too, don't worry. <laughs> if you ever want to hear me ramble about something, I got a laundry list of things I hate, but um, that's not what that's about. The suburbs are just such a terrible, terrible system. I mean, and there's a few really good reasons for that. Um, and mostly it's the consequences of having suburbs. What are the consequences? Well, first of all, it looks bad, okay? We have terrible <laughs> little cookie cutter homes that look almost exactly the same. Um, and that's pretty obvious, but when you really get down to the nitty gritty of it, um, you have the systems that have brought about suburbia. You have systems of zoning laws that segregate out all of this right here into districts. So um, the way city planning is done, you have allocated spaces for commercial areas, for homes, for um, schools and all that. And it's so spread out and it's wildly inefficient. I mean, I'm sure the parents and even some of the students in here know how long it takes to get anywhere. I mean, that's what I, I don't like driving all that much, mostly because, I mean, to get from my house to a grocery store, you know, if I'm just feeling, oh, I could go for a bag of chips, maybe a soda, that's 15 minutes in the car there. I can't walk somewhere. Um, I can't really walk to see my friends because my friends live 20, 30 minutes away from me because of this terrible suburban sprawl. I can't walk to school in a reasonable amount of time because, again, it's so far away. But why, why would we do that to ourselves? Why, why is this the way that we have built up everything? There's so much behind that. There's so many factors that have gone into that, but a lot of it just boils down to this really poor construction. I mean, pollution because of suburban areas is off the charts. And I mean, I have a source list at the end because I'm thorough, but <laughs> there's so much data that supports all this. The amount of CO2 emissions from um, people living in these suburban complexes is significantly higher than those living in cities. You know, cities have this image, especially in American culture, of being these like really dirty areas and that you have rats scampering around, um, trash piles, graffiti, this terrible image, um, you know, of like inner cities and downtowns and um, despite all of that, suburbs are far more inefficient. Suburbs don't allow for children to, to live together um, and, you know, go to the park to hit up a little um, slide and swing set because it's so far away and we have this phenomenon then of helicopter parents, of children not being able to properly interact with one another. Um, children can get the school on their own in suburban areas as opposed to, let's say, Europe. Um, I default to Europe mostly because, you know, cities there are a lot older, a lot more built up, and also um, that's where my family's from. So this, you don't see this in Europe. This is not the case at all, ever. Um, <laughs> this is a very uniquely American phenomenon. Um, and in other countries, other parts of the world, you're able to walk to school, you're able to walk to um, convenience store, you're able to just go outdoors and be with your friends instead of having to have parents drive you halfway across the city, that's like a good 20, 30 miles even. Um, and that takes up time, that takes up gas, that takes up money. Um, there's studies to support that actually puts a strain on family life, and you wouldn't think that a suburb um, and the way that our system designed around suburbs would result in, in marital issues and in conflicts within families and, of course, the significant environmental damage that you come across from having suburbs. And these are all of these little things that you wouldn't chalk up to having, you know, from, from suburbs. But the existence of suburbs have led us to having these terrible highways 
have, what is it, six to eight lane highways um, just filled with uh, cars and still an impressive amount of congestion. But why, do we, why should we have them? There's no point. It's all to support this lifestyle that we've pretty arbitrarily come across. Um, it's something that kind of just happened over a few decades of, of housing, of urban planning. I mean, it's a pretty recent phenomenon. I mean, just uh, a few decades ago, you would have huge population centers in cities, and that's still the case in most parts of the world, except for the United States, where you have highway systems that kind of, like in Phoenix's case, you have the loops of the highways that they connect kind of in the center, and that brings in all the people from the suburbs. But more and more people's commutes are just so inefficient. I mean, it can take 30 to 40 minutes. I believe the average in America that people set aside for commuting is an hour. Um, an hour every single day for, let's say, five days a week, um, for the rest of your life, just sitting in traffic, um, all for the purpose of living the community like this, which, again, isn't great for anyone involved. Not for the environment, um, it's far more expensive, it's far less beneficial to children and their upbringing, but this is what we have. And it's kind of what we're stuck with right now. And, um, while I've touched up on some of the reasons for why, I, I'd like to, you know, come up with a little hot take for why. Um, it's cut off there on the slideshow, unfortunately, but it's, it's to pre preserve the... Whoop. No one saw that. Uh, <laughs> we have ego and nihilism. Well, you're asking yourself, stranger who I might have never seen, um, what, is, what do these niche philosophical topics have to do with suburbia? Well, let me tell you. Um, why do we have this fixation on living our lives like this? Why must we feel the need to segregate ourselves in cul-de-sacs and in far-reaching corners of small streets weaving in through our town? It boils down to the idea of ego. Well, what is ego? Um, no, not the character from Attitude, unfortunately. But instead, it's an idea of self and what it means to be one's own person. Um, and you can talk a lot about that, and I think some of the presentations actually do touch up on that. But in the context of this, um, ego comes into play with people having the need, the desire to build up their own little communities and having themselves cut off from the rest of the world. And you would think, you know, archetypally, um, and, and ads and in old movies, you have this idea of like block parties in the suburbs, um, people from the cul-de-sac having a barbecue or a grill off, that's fine and dandy, but it's still such an isolated community. It still festers off the need to be isolated, and it really does segregate families apart from one another by having this idea that you have your own lawn, you have a pool in the back, and you have like this self-sustaining, almost cut-off piece of your own world. Um, instead of wanting to engage with the people around you, you're instead content with existing in your own bubble almost. You're not willing to um, reach out to the people across the street from you, but instead you have this idea that you have to take it upon yourself to drive your kids 30 minutes across um, town to the soccer practice, or you have to hover over your child um, from going, you know, parents commonly don't let their children go to a playground, and instead they feel the need that they have to be the ones who take that responsibility upon themselves. And it seems like a strange approach to take to this issue, but I do think that's really what it comes down to. You have this idea of self-preservation, and that creates a really fierce resistance to any sort of openness in someone's life. Oh, well, that was a bit of a downer though, right? I mean, and I wouldn't want to leave you without any solutions. Um, and that brings me to the idea of communitarianism. No, it's not communism, I'm not trying to scare you off that much, um, but communitarianism instead. Well, what's that? That's the idea of community. Um, and instead of having these suburbs, that instead a community should be what the name implies. We have restrictive zoning laws that create huge networks of highways that go on for miles and miles, where you have to make incredible commutes to get anywhere. Um, where the store is not nearly close enough to you to walk to, so inside you resort to driving, you create fossil fuel emissions, and you really break yourself apart from the world around you. But instead, 
an idea like the aforementioned European cities is so much more favorable in almost every single sense of the word. It improves people's mental health, it improves relationships and families, and it enhances people's economic situation, and it's just really, it's a win across the board. But instead, we're content with the way that we've gotten used to, and instead of wanting to enact any change, we favor the idea of the cliched American idea, um, dream, where you have your own home on the cul-de-sac, um, you know, like the garage, large um, front lawn, the back lawn, and having to mow the grass and all that good stuff. But instead, we should favor a much more urbanized world. Um, and that's probably, on the face, a scary to some people. But instead of wanting to engage in that, people will favor this more suburban lifestyle, something that we've gotten used to. And instead of a world with trains. Um, I like trains a lot. Huge fan of trains. Trains are amazing. What does it have to do with trains? Well, um, trains would be such an amazing solution to fixing this issue. So hopefully by now, you've seen all the issues, so what are the solutions? And that's it. Let's say it's trains. Um, and this is an excuse for me to talk about trains as much as I always like those excuses. But a train system, a robust train system, like the ones in Chicago, let's say. Chicago is well known for one of its, uh, one of America's best public transit systems. Um, and while there are divisions in the public transit system, there's different authorities that take control over it. The train system in Chicago is great for bridging people from the outskirts into the center. People are much more able to make their commutes, and it really does bring together people of all walks of life. Public transit is known as the great social equalizer because it brings people down to a level where they're much more able to compete and much more able to get themselves off the ground. And instead of having a system where people have to drive, waste gas, waste time, and waste time from their families, from doing the things that they want, instead a system like this would bring people together. And having these robust public transit systems allows for an improvement of life in almost every regard. That seems like a high claim, right, to make, but there's so much data to substantiate this. There's an incredible amount of people's lives works that are put into looking at this, looking at how much public transit helps people's lives, how much um, the, the impacts of suburban life have affected people, and how much better an urbanized wealth would be. People think of urbanization as this almost terrible, almost scary word, but instead of looking at it that way, all I ask is that you Consider the merits of living in a more densely populated, more culturally rich, more connected world, where instead of having to worry about you know having another fifty dollar gas gas bill, which keeps getting higher every single year, instead of a world where you're much more connected with the people around you, where you have streets um, that have walking space and have tree, uh, tree cover for pedestrians, instead of the neighborhoods that have the wide lawns and the sidewalk only on one side, because it's not built around people. Our world right now, in the suburbs, we can't walk anywhere where you're constrained to these subdivisions of, of small homes. That's not built for people. Instead, consider a world like that image right there. It's a wonderful illustration from the Atlantic. Uh, that imagines a world where it's a lot more people-focused, where you can walk anywhere, where you're able to get around to the stores, to the schools that you need to go to without having to hop into the car. I'd like to leave you off um, after that rambling on with an excerpt from a book, um, Utopia by Thomas More. Um, don't read it all, that's a lot of text. Um, I won't read it all because it's a lot of text and my head hurts by now, but I would like to leave you off with that last sentence right there. Doubtless, unless you find the remedy for those enormities, you shall in vain advance yourself ex executing justice upon felons. Thank you. Hello, and now we have 
another <coughs> performance from improv, but just a quick little note before improv comes on, we are not going to be having an intermission due to COVID, so if you have to use the bathroom or anything, just feel free to get up and go. It's right across those doors. So yeah, and here is improv. Actually, perfectly. 
right there in, in those face. My name. My name. You say my name. <laughs> Do you need time to think about it? I don't know. I mean, this face looked like it would fit Monica, but I don't think Stacy would appreciate that. I mean, I mean, maybe if I write it, you know, really swally, I can go with Baltimore, but I just don't know how that's going to work out. In the limo. <laughs> In the limo. So, I have a cool video. Maybe I could play it? No. Can someone play the video for me? Alright, so our universe, as we know it, starts with a bang. A very big bang, and they call it the Big Bang. It is an explosion that is unlike anything the universe will ever see again. No one really knows where it came from or where it goes through, but what we know is from that primordial cloud of gas, there's a lot of hydrogen, a lot of helium, and a little bit of lithium, and this thing called gravity starts to pack it all together, and by the way, in this presentation, you're going to want to pay attention because I'm going to go fast. Um, it starts to pack it all together into these things called stars. You might have seen one. Um, it's why we're alive right now. So these stars in our early universe start to form. They're giant explosions, giant nuclear reactors, and they fuse these lighter elements into heavier things, so hydrogen and helium, helium and lithium, so forth, so forth. And these stars bind together in these things called galaxies. Some galaxies, as you see here, form so closely together that they merge in these big, fantastic mergers. This is the big event of the early universe, galaxy mergers. At the middle of every single galaxy, we have this thing called a supermassive black hole. There is a supermassive black hole in the middle of our galaxy. Kind of concerning to think about that there's a giant black hole in our galaxy. But um, it's really not that scary because it's pretty far away from us. So, as you can see here, our galaxy is starting to form. It is a new super galaxy. This is likely how our Milky Way formed from a bunch of smaller galaxies. We have seen the Milky Way actually eating up other galaxies right now. Um, there's a nice view of the Milky Way as we see it today, more or less. If you've ever seen that band across the sky, that's actually the galaxy. It's kind of weird. We're on the plane. Um, but as I mentioned, at the, in, the, ugh, excuse me, in the middle of every single galaxy is a supermassive black hole. These form when a star is so massive 
that after it explodes, everything kind of condenses in into this thing called a singularity. It's an infinitely small point. It is so dense that not even light can escape it. The light that does escape it is past what we call the event horizon. And so as you can see, you can see all these clouds of gas and dust being whipped around the event horizon, which is that black hole in the middle. Um, this is like, this is why we can see black holes, because they release tremendous amounts of energy. They will rip anything apart, whether it is a big star or a little star, or planet, planets don't survive. If you were near a black hole, you would experience something called spaghettification. I don't think I need to explain that. Um, they're going to get ripped apart at the atoms. So these black holes are lethal. They will eat anything, and there's really no stopping them, um, which is important to remember as we come back later. But as I mentioned, these black holes are formed when really, really big stars blow up. But they have to be really big stars. Um, and these are called supernova. You might have seen them before. Uh, well, you probably haven't seen one, but you might have heard of them before. Um, so when these stars blow up, they release huge, huge clouds of gas. As you can see here, all sorts of materials. And from one of these supernovas, in something we call planetary nebula, does not form planets, I don't know why they call it that, was the birth of a sun like our sun. So, the sun seen here is our sun, or a very, very good animation of it. Um, our sun formed, it's not that big of a star, but it's not that small either, with a huge, huge band of gas and dust and stuff around it, and a lot of asteroids. One of these, hello? It's still working. One of these asteroids is called Earth, as you can see here. Earth was bombarded with tiny little asteroids but the thing is about Earth, Earth actually had the biggest collision in the early inner solar system. That's a protoplanet, Theia, that totally decimated our planet. Um, over time, those condensed with gravity and became the Earth and the Moon. Um, if you didn't know, the Moon is responsible for life as well because it pulls the tides. So that collision was actually very important to our existence. But early Earth is not really a fun place to be. There's a lot of volcanoes. A lot of lightning. There are some oceans that are starting to form, though, from water that probably came from outside asteroids. We're not really sure. But there's a lot of water. But as these volcanoes are changing the landscape every day and making it really hard for life to exist, the perfect conditions for life actually already exist very, very deep in the ocean. These underwater volcanoes are spewing out these chemicals. And these chemicals allow microbial life to thrive. Single cellular, they duplicate, they evolve, and they start to kind of edit themselves into more complex things, more complex things. And it's like this for about a billion years, very simple life. And then after an ice age, everything just suddenly booms into intelligent life. So we're seeing these things that are so complex, multicellular organisms. Some you might recognize, things like jellyfish or nautilus or dinosaurs. And they start to come onto land, plants are starting to grow as well. Everything is setting up for what is going to be on the Earth. And for this very, very, very quick second, you're going to see something called mammals and humans. Now, we don't know how long humans are going to last. It probably won't be very long, because we're not as smart creatures. Um, but things will go on after that point. So in about 100 years or so, hail Bob will return as a fairy famous comet. Some of our neighboring stars, like Antares, will go to supernova. Things like the Sahara will turn into a rainforest in about 1,000 years or so. And 37,000 take the constellations start to wander, Voyager 1 passes by the nearest star across the Centauri, and life continues to go on on the Earth. This is 100,000 years from now, probably about the time there will be a super volcano eruption, mass extinction event for anything that could be living on Earth. That will happen in Idaho, so right in our backyard. Hopefully we are not still around 100,000 years or so, because that will not be too fun to witness. Um, things erode, things become new, Apollo footprints fade in about 10,000 years or so. Sorry, 110,000. No, one million years. I'm oh, sorry, I got a little blip, blip, time. Yay time. So Betelgeuse also explodes, as you saw there a second ago. That's our favorite red supergiant. And things continue to change. Even our solar system backyard starts to change. As you can see here, Mars will form a ring from all of its debris that it gathers from the asteroid belt. And Saturn will lose its own ring. Which is kind of sad, because we really like Saturn's rings. Um, and if there are nothing that can prevent it on Earth, there is definitely going to be in the next million-ish years, billion years, a huge asteroid that will wipe everything out on Earth. But in about five billion years, none of it's going to matter because the sun is going to run out of hydrogen. When it does, it's going to start burning helium. I'm not sure if you've ever seen a helium balloon before, but it likes to expand in quite a lot. So when the sun starts to use helium, it's going to expand into something called a red giant. And when it does, it will evaporate the oceans, kill all plant life that could be remaining, 
it swallows Mercury, it swallows Venus, and then finally, it swallows the Earth. So, yeah. <laughs> Basically, we won't be here for much longer, this is about 4 billion years. But the sun does not explode. The sun shrinks into something called white dwarf. It releases all of its gases. It's not massive enough to explode. White dwarfs are carcasses of stars that once were. And so in about a trillion years, even the most stable stars, things like red dwarfs, themselves will die and become white dwarfs. So any kind of civilization that could be remaining exists around these white dwarfs. Things like Dyson spheres, you know, those energy things you build around a star, like the Death Star, those actually start to become a kind of realistic way of living if you have the technology to do so. These litter our solar system. We've seen them today, but it's really going to be all that's left. It's kind of the depressing end. But here's the problem. Oh, sorry, I forgot the part. Things don't stop, necessarily. Things like neutron star mergers, which are these really crazy stars I won't get into, these still happen, and these light up the solar system when they do. It, not the solar system, the entire universe when they do. But generally, no new stars are being formed. And so these white dwarfs, over time, they stop producing energy, and they become black dwarfs, which are just giant balls of degenerate matter. There's nothing left. They don't burn. They don't release really any light. And it's kind of a sad, dark end to our universe. And so at this point, the only kind of civilization that can survive, it, you can't survive around black dwarfs. There's no energy. The only way you can survive is by somehow utilizing the power of the black hole, the energy it produces to exist. But this is the part of our universe for trillions upon trillions upon trillions of years, and I've stressed that enough, a long time, that us ourselves, matter as we know it, starts to change. Protons, the very fundamental building blocks, disappear into nothing. They're just gone. Um, and so matter as we know it ceases to exist. Our black dwarves that we like to talk about, they literally evaporate, like on the spot. They just poof into nothing. And so at this point in our universe, um, all that changes is now we don't have matter anymore. We still have dark energy, which propels the expansion of the universe at an increasing rate. We have black holes and we have photons, which are light particles. So this is going to be kind of disturbing, but this is under 1% of our universe. This is the very, very infancy. Life does not exist for very long. The universe as we know it is a black hole universe. 99% of its life is going to be dominated by black hole galaxies, which are black holes that orbit other black holes and get drawn in. Some will fall in, some will merge. The big event is black hole merger because they will off a huge amount of energy. But this is our galaxy as we know it, devoid of light, devoid of any opportunity for life. And it's pretty sad. It's going to continue to spread apart so these black hole galaxies will not really interact. But the thing we know about quantum physics is that nothing really can last forever. So even these black holes will evaporate. And as they do, one by one, they'll let off huge amounts of ex huge explosions that light up the universe. This is, I think, trillion of trillion of trillion to like the 29th power or something years. This is a very, very long time. But one by one, they will light up the universe with these huge explosions. This is kind of the final stand for our universe as we know it. The universe doesn't cease to exist, but the last thing that we know of in the universe, these black holes, these last structures, they will start to evaporate. And there are one day, there's going to be one final black hole, and when it does, the universe itself will be lit up for one final time. Right there. And when it happens, all that's left is the photons. They're slowly going to absolute zero. Time becomes meaningless. There is nothing to balance it against. So you must think, well, this kind of sucks. What are we going to do? Can we live forever? That's kind of where you think, maybe it's not us. Maybe it's something else. When we think about evolution, we consider ourselves, you know, evolved from apes, monkeys, um, which evolved from, I don't know, smaller monkeys, which evolved from stuff in the ocean, right? But what if inorganic life is also part of that evolution? What if machines, which are not bounded by biological limitations, like having to eat, sleep, drink, having feelings, you know? What if they are able to exist forever? If they're somehow able to stop their protons from decaying in a closed system? This is what I like to call the perfect machine. It's a machine that's sole purpose is to exist forever because nothing likes to die, not even machines. So the thing is about this perfect machine is to learn about the universe because it cannot understand how to live forever unless it learns about the universe. But the problem is, is that this machine will not really know what our universe looks like because this machine is going to take a long time to develop. It's hard technology, and we definitely can never comprehend it ourselves. So the machine is going to try to learn, and when it does this, it will create a universe 
exactly like our own, identical, to the very point. Like I just breathed right there. That is the universe that the perfect machine makes. But the thing is, the perfect machine doesn't know how to make this universe because there's a lot of possibilities. There's a finite number of ways protons can be arranged. It's a huge number, but there are a finite amount of universes that can exist with our laws of physics. The perfect machine is going to make all of them to try to figure out what's the answer. Is there some God equation that dictates how things operate in our universe? And so it's going to literally have eons upon eons of these artificial universes in which I exist exactly as I am, in which I don't exist, in which I get married to someone and another one in which I kill them. You know, it's crazy things that happen. But this machine is going to continue to make them all trying to figure out, okay, what's the answer? Who am I? How do I exist forever? And so now you start to think to yourself, okay, well, am I going to exist again? Exactly as I am right now? And the answer is probably, maybe, possibly. Um, it's kind of hard to tell. That's the really like animation I like to use for the perfect machine. It's pretty cool. But the machine itself will take our universe and it'll create its own artificial universes. Some of these artificial universes will be exactly like our own, and if we have a perfect machine on our own, some of these artificial universes will start to make their own perfect machines, which do the same thing and try to figure out where they came from. And so they make a lot of artificial universes, which make their own perfect, you see where I'm going with this. So this mother universe, we could be the first universe, or we could be in a simulation. I know people say that, oh, we could be in a simulation. But like, legitimately, we could be. We don't know. We can't leave our own universe. So universes which have intelligent life, like our own, have the ability to reproduce into child universes, almost. And there's probably a lot of these, even if you know we are the product of some other mother universe, unless we're going to make it. You know, there's a lot of opportunity. And so when these child universes start to exist everywhere, a lot of them are going to have the same physical makeups as our universe does. And when this happens, there's a finite amount of possibilities, but there's an infinite amount of time, because time is meaningless. So it'll have forever to make us a bunch of times, but it can only do it so, so many times. And so we're not going to exist once again, we're going to exist again, and again, and again. And eventually, over so, so much time, you can see the universe is multiplying, we are going to exist like all the time and none of the time. It's a Schrodinger's cat, which is basically we're all alive and dead at the same time because in some places we exist and others we don't. And so, oh, the video started over somehow. Oopsie. Well, I put the clicker in my pocket, that's probably why. But I'm almost at my end of my point anyways. Can I stop the video? It's okay, just ignore the video. Um, I'm at the end of my point, which I can say that we are both mortal we, we may be both mortal and immortal at the same time because we are all alive and dead simultaneously. This machine, which the perfect machine's fatal imperfection is that it cannot understand there is a limit, something that is bounding it to stop. And so it'll forever continue to create these artificial universes. And so we will forever continue to exist over and over and over again. Thank you. and the length of their life. Um, and they also have 
They also have a use of complex songs as a form of communication, which is something that not a lot of other birds have. Um, the saber finches learn by listening and repeating from tuners, which is a kind of uh, an older version of the zebra finch, and they know more songs and they are know more complex songs, and so they learn from them. Um, they perfect their songs throughout the day, um, so if you hear a song in the morning, it'll probably be better at night. Um, next up, we have a little video to show you just how much a zebra finch loves to sing. Um, so this will 
predict uh, when musical motifs started and stopped with over 70% accuracy. So, and then another study found out that the vocal organs carry out full vocalization sequences when a song is played. This is referred to as harmonic hypnosis. So, do, these electrodes um, have proven that these birds actually are singing in their sleep and that when they're stimulated by music, the vocal organs will carry out full vocalization while they're sleeping. So continuing off of what Caroline just said, this picture kind of shows that in a visual form. This, um, the up and down of the lines on the picture show the movement of vocal organs, the syringeal muscles, during the bird's song. Now the one at the top in color is when the bird is singing during the day, and the one that's not in color at the bottom is the movement that the vocal organs are making when the bird is asleep. So you can see how similar they are, and that shows that even though the bird is not physically singing while it's asleep, it's moving its vocal organs in a way to mimic the song that it sings during the daytime, further showing that it's dreaming of its own songs. Now you'll also see that it's not a perfect match because there are some parts that are added, some parts that are changed, some parts that are taken away. And this again goes back to the composing part where a bird is adjusting its song, improving it for whatever reason, whatever act of communication it wants to achieve. And all this is happening while it's asleep. So in conclusion, and kind of the reason that I picked this topic was I think it's just quite interesting. We as humans were able to hear and see a bird sing, you know, in the physical world, but we also developed the technology to see it on another level in the dreams. And we we developed the science and the studies to show that birds do dream of their songs and also compose new ones. And that's pretty cool. So thank you for listening to our presentation. Hello. So my presentation is on the America's global influence. So there seems to be, in the United States, an issue of blinding nationalism. A nationalism that causes much of the population to view this country as a beacon of democracy and freedom. A country that, through its foreign military intervention, has saved the world from evil powers and ideologies, given several countries their liberation, and has brought justice to several countries and peoples that needed it. But this is not even close to reality. The United States is not, and never has truly been, the good guy. In fact, the United States government is responsible for several crimes, massacres, and atrocities throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. The United States has a long track record of evil, and this speech will detail some of those atrocities. And I would also just like to point out that the list I'm about to cover does not contain all of the nations that the United States has intervened in. This list will not even contain all of the horrors committed in any of these nations. This list will only include a few events from a few countries, because I would never be able to cover them all. After a coup d'etat in Argentina in 1976 that deposed a democratically elected leader Isabel Perón, the military dictatorship of Jorge Rafael Videla was eagerly endorsed and supported by the U.S. government, with Secretary of State Henry Kissinger having frequent visits to Argentina during this time. Among the many human rights violations committed during the period were extrajudicial arrests, mass executions, torture, rape, disappearances of political prisoners in the centers, and illegal relocations of children born from pregnant women, both pregnant before their imprisonment and made pregnant by the continuous rape while in prison. According to Spanish Central Court Judge Balthazar Garzón, who spent a portion of his career investigating South American right-wing despots, Kissinger was not only aware, but a witness to these crimes. In Brazil, after the U.S.-backed coup in 1964, which deposed Social Democrat Joe Goulart, Brazil had decades of heavily repressive, heavily repressive, strict authoritarian rule. Once again, with ample backing and support from the U.S., Henry Kissinger was once again aware of the brutal killings, tortures, kidnappings, and indigenous genocides that occurred during this time. 
in Chile after the democratic election of Salvador Allende in 1970, an economic war which involved influence from Milton Friedman and the Chicago Boys was waged by President Richard Nixon. This, among other things, caused the 1973 Chilean coup d'etat, which included heavy involvement from the CIA due to Allende's democratic socialist leanings. A declassified report from the U.S. government, titled Annex-NSSM-97, details an early plan to overthrow Allende if he were to take office. The document explicitly states that the U.S. government's role should not be revealed and would primarily use Chilean institutions, highlighted specifically was the military, as a means of ousting the president. What followed was the decades-long U.S.-backed military dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. I don't need to explain that one. In 1988, a presidential referendum was held in order to confirm Pinochet's ruling for eight more years. Thankfully, the referendum ended up ousting Pinochet and ending his rule democratically. Now, I bring up South American countries for the initial purpose for this initial time period because of Operation Condor. Operation Condor was a United States-backed campaign of political repression and state terror involving intelligence operations and assassinations of opponents. This was officially and formally implemented in November of 1975 by the right-wing dictatorships of South America. Due to its clandestine nature, the precise number of deaths directly attributable to this operation remain unknown to this day. Some estimates are that at least 60,000 people have died, with 30,000 of these coming directly from Argentina. And the archives of terror list 50,000 dead, 30,000 disappearing, and 400,000 imprisoned. Victims included dissidents, leftists, union and peasant leaders, priests, nuns, students, teachers, and intellectuals. It is important to remember that these events are really just the tip of the iceberg in intervention and American intervention in South America. This is just the stuff I can say in a few minutes. There are years of history to cover. With the deaths from Operation Condor, along with the other plentiful interventions and other forms of influence terror, it is very safe to say that the United States has been responsible for over a million casualties in South America, let alone tortures, rapes, and kidnappings. Now I'd like to move on from South America and focus on another part of the country, another part of the world, sorry, in this case, Indonesia, in which the left-leaning go left government of President Sukarno in the 1960s was overthrown in a military coup by General Suharto. This new regime quickly went after everyone who was opposed to it, Nonviolent communist supporters, Indonesian women's movements, trade union movement organizers and activists, intellectuals, teachers, land reform advocates, and those of Chinese descent were all targeted. Over the course of two years, it is estimated that as many as two and a half million of these people were massacred. The methods of, the methods of violence include, and killing included shooting, dismembering alive, stabbing, disembowelment, castration, impaling, and strangling and beheading with swords. Corpses were often thrown into rivers, and at one point, officials complained to the army of congested rivers that run into the city of Surabaya due to the pileup of the bodies. In certain areas, the right-wing youth movement lined up people, cut their throats, and disposed of the bodies in rivers. Rows of severed body parts were often left behind as a reminder to the rest of those who were kept alive. The killings left whole sections of villages empty, and the houses of those in the, and the houses and the houses of the victims or the interned were often looted and handed over to the military. The U.S. was very much involved in providing money, weapons, radios, and supplies to this new government. The U.S. government also provided death lists with not, not only the names of specific people, but of groups of people that they wanted killed. And while most of the information about U.S. involvement about this event is still classified, there is no doubt that the United States was the main instigator, and is partially, at least, if not fully guilty for the death for every death in this operation. And now I get to Turkey, which in 1980 suffered its most brutal coup in its history. On September 12, 1980, Chief of Armed Forces General Kenan Emre declared a coup in the country over the radio, stating a need of return of order in the country. What followed was a complete change in the political structure of the Turkish government. Politicians, judges, and journalists were all arrested and placed under government surveillance. Teachers, civil servants, and intellectuals were relieved of their positions and placed under government surveillance. Many people were sentenced to death. Torture, assassination, and under and torture, assassination, and extrajudicial killings were rampant. 650,000 people were detained. 1.7 million people were blacklisted, put under government surveillance, tortured, or banned from participating in society. 230,000 people were tried under civil lawsuits, 
and hundreds of thousands of people fled the country, either as political refugees or because their passports were denied or revoked. It was during this time that the repression and the conflict with Kurdish people began as well. And although the exact identity of the individual is up to speculation, either the CIA station chief of Ankara, Paul Henze, or another U.S. diplomat, cabled Washington during the early hours of September 12, 1980 to tell the Carter administration directly, our boys in Ankara did it. Now regarding these events, it might seem that all of the events brought up tonight happened in the distant past, relics of the 20th century or relics of the Cold War, and that these were merely just short-term events. But the events are still being felt in Turkey, where the mothers of those who went missing still come out every weekend demanding to know where their sons and daughters went. There are still members in the Chilean government left over from the Pinochet era. Brazil still has a major lean towards far-right politics, and General Suharto of Indonesia only left office in 1998. I haven't even covered the most known or the, or the, most, or the worst of the events. Like how the Naira testimony that claimed, that claimed babies in Kuwait were being ripped out of their incubators was a complete fabrication. Or how our military left 4.5 million innocent orphans in Iraq in 2003. Now what can we do? Before I move on, I just want to clarify that this presentation is not meant to be inherently anti-American. And while this presentation is a critique, quite a harsh critique of the United States, it is meant in the context of it being a major world power, which is where I believe the issue lies. This presentation could have been about Russia, France, England, or China, or any country that has a relatively large foreign influence. But I chose to focus on the United States because instead of simply looking at other countries and criticizing them for their actions, we must also seek to improve our own nation. Now regarding improvement, there are a few ways to get involved and to improve the current system. But I won't give you the name of a charity to donate to, nor will I give you the name of an important petition to sign, as this issue runs far too deep within the political framework of this country for those who have any real impact. Change can only be brought about by protest, or for those of you who deem that a bit too radical, by the means of democratic vote. We, the United States, must remember that the people we vote for and the subsequent people they appoint to their cabinet and other areas of government can and often have a much greater influence on more people outside of this country than in it. And lastly, to the people in the crowd who view our actions as a necessary evil or downplay the effects of these events, please just consider the millions in Indonesia, consider the millions in Turkey, consider the millions in South America, and consider the hundreds of millions of people who have suffered mental, physical, and economic terror at the hands of the United States. People who have seen the absolute evils of United States military and economic intervention. Consider your family that grew up under economic and political turmoil, repression, and terror. That grew up with either a brutal, with, that grew up with either a brutal coup every few years or strict authoritarian rule for the majority of their lives, being watched and tracked at every public place, afraid they'll be taken away by the secret police. Consider it, because many people in this country, and presumably many people in this crowd, aren't victim to that. They aren't victim to a system that was forced on them by a nation they have no say in, no control over. Consider what makes us different from countries such as Russia or China in terms of foreign intervention. If you, can, if you can't justify the actions of those countries, but you can justify the actions of ours, then that is where the problem of nationalism lies. Remember that we are no better than them. We are arguably worse. But there is a solution. There is still hope for this country, and it requires us to hold our politicians accountable for their crimes and to end our needless intervention in foreign countries. And that needs the will of you and the rest of the people in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Oz. All right, and up next is Improv's final performance. So, 
So, your first, your first prompt. Unusual cases for the FBI.
Uh, could, you, could you put the word in a sentence? Um, <laughs> oh. I don't know. I was going to spell a word, but I couldn't think of a funny word. <laughs> Let me explain to you complex numbers. <laughs> um, before COVID, I could put my whole fist in my mouth. <laughs> The worst place to find a cucumber. <laughs> okay, okay, I understand that one. <laughs> um, inappropriate elementary school field trips.
Friday is our final improv show, so feel free to tune in online. Details coming soon. I apologize in advance for the big move of flash that's about to happen from that last improv performance. Alright. Three months ago, I cut off one of the closest and unhealthiest friendships I've ever had. We met during summer of last year through mutual close friends and clicked almost instantly. It was a long distance friendship. He lived in the UK, I lived here, but we managed to make it work. It was great for a while, until things started spiraling down from there. We both had our separate mental issues, but his became overwhelming, and he turned to me and only me for help. Weeks turned into months, and I found myself playing therapist for him constantly, needing to be ready to jump in at any moment, from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed, sacrificing my schoolwork, my, my health, and my relationships with my friends. Eventually, my self-worth was declined to the point where I saw myself only as how well I was doing with helping him and how much of a good friend I was. It took me seeing a therapist to realize just how bad that mentality is. And when things, when things with that friend didn't get much better, I completely cut off my connection with him weeks later. Without that friendship weighing on me, I've been able to work on myself again and connect more with other people. And with talking to other friends, I've found that this overall experience is actually very common among teens. Thousands of teens in the United States find themselves in un unhealthy situations with friends, family, and even in romantic relationships, especially when we bring technology and social media into the picture. And mental health is slowly but surely becoming a more prevalent and open topic for us to discuss, especially among our demographic. The type of relationship that I had with my friend is one that impacts mental health on a much larger scale that can spiral into things such as anxiety and depression and can even lead to abuse. And it's more preventable when we know what to look out for in these relationships and how to better take care of ourselves. So let's talk about that. When I say relationship, I mean any kind of interaction between people. This applies a lot to romantic relationships, but can also apply to friends, family, and even coworkers. No relationship is perfect. There is always some kind of conflict between people. But a toxic relationship is one that has mentalities and behaviors that will overall damage a person. There can be a lack of support, um, miscommunication, a lot of competition. Overall, if the relationship has more negatives than it does positives, it can be classified as unhealthy. And red flags are a pretty common term to indicate when there is a behavior that we should be looking out for or should be concerned about. They put you down a lot more to build themselves up. Red flag. They don't pay attention to anything that you have to say. Red flag. But a lot of red flags in relationships only come once you have that connection with someone and you build that trust. When your opinion of them is positive, these red flags tend to go overlooked and we justify the negative behavior because we know the person has a good person and we know that they would never intentionally want to hurt us. But that doesn't mean that those red flags should go overlooked. It's just complicated by the history you have with them. Because we tend to overlook these behaviors, toxic relationships are a lot more prevalent than we realize, and it's a lot harder to know exactly what to look out for. There are a few universal red flags, though. Things you'll find in almost every toxic relationship, and they manifest themselves in numerous ways. The first is manipulation. Manipulation is essentially influencing someone else's mentality or behaviors in a way that they don't consent to, especially if they're unaware that you're doing it in the first place. The second 
is isolation, cutting off the other person from people that they care about or people that they want to be around. These two behaviors can manifest themselves physically, mentally, or emotionally, and it's not often crystal clear when we do see them. It normally takes a bit more of an analysis to fully understand what's going on. Take, for example, let's say we have two people. Their names are Tom and Sarah, and they're dating. Tom doesn't want Sarah hanging out with anyone else, so he forces Sarah to stay with him 24-7 and tell him whenever she talks to anyone else who is going out. That is a textbook example of manipulation and isolation, but a lot of the time it's a lot more nuanced. Tom might instead start nitpicking and talking bad about little behaviors that Sarah's friends do and, and attempt to paint them in a negative light. Over time, Sarah starts begin, beginning to feel doubt towards her friends and slowly pulls away from them. And eventually, Sarah has stopped talking to her friends entirely, and Tom has complete control over her actions and her behaviors. Isolation and manipulation are always gradual processes. Another thing that people will find in toxic relationships is feelings of guilt or obligation, where they always feel guilty whenever they're not around the other person, or they feel obligated to be there 24-7, even when they don't want to be. And this feeling is a major detriment to any kind of relationship. People can often feel like they're obligated to stay through feelings of guilt or even being threatened by the other person. When we hear phrases like, do this or I'll hurt you, or even do this or I'll hurt myself, which opens up an entirely different can of worms that should be dealt with separately, but it is important to note when taking these into account. And finally, those relationships will more often than not involve overstepping boundaries, where someone will feel a lack of personal space, and the other person will pry into every personal detail and want to know everything about who they're talking to and where they're going at all times. And this lack of privacy can lead to some very toxic and unhealthy behavior. Now, these behaviors are very important for us to be able to identify because they can lead to some very deep impacts on our mental health. These relationships can lead to a loss of privacy and dependency on the other person which can then lead to a lack of personal identity and independence, and from there it can spiral into things like depression and anxiety disorders. And more often than we think, these relationships can lead to some form of abuse, whether it's physical, emotional, or even sexual. Again, these relationships are more common than we think. It's easy to listen to this and think, well, what are the odds that this would happen to me? This is something I feel like I would know when someone is experiencing some form of abuse. When in reality, as of 2015, one out of every three adolescents in the United States will experience some form of abuse, whether it's from a family member, a friend, or even in a romantic relationship. So among our demographic, it really is more likely to happen to us than we think it is. And by being able to identify these toxic behaviors, you are minimizing the chance that you become that one out of three. Now, if you look at these behaviors and realize that this is a situation you're in right now, or it's something that you find yourself in in the future, there are ways that you can get yourself out. It's always good to go into this with a plan. The first step is always to talk to the other person. Bringing their behavior to their attention is a good thing because sometimes they might not even be aware that they're doing it. And this can solve the problem without taking any more action. If the other person apologizes and begins working towards trying to improve themselves and improve the relationship, then that's a good thing. It shows that they genuinely care and it might be a good relationship to keep in your life. But if nothing changes or things actually get worse from there, then the best thing for you to do is to distance yourself from the relationship and get out of it if you can. Staying in it is only going to cause more impact on your mental health. And at this point, nothing else is going to happen unless you take action for yourself. 
if there is a threat of harm to someone, including yourself or the other person, then it's okay to bring in another person that you trust to help you with the situation. No matter what happens, if, no matter what happens, you need to do what's best for you. And that is putting some distance between the two of you. From there, find your support system. There is always someone out there that is looking out for your best interests and wants to help you in any way that they can. Whether it's a family member, a friend, a boss at work, a teacher or coach, or even seeing a professional. I wasn't able to leave my toxic friendship without the help of a licensed therapist. There is always someone here to help. You just have to seek them out. And finally, reinforcing your boundaries will help you figure out what's best for you. Knowing what you can and can't handle in a relationship can help you avoid the situation in the future, or at the very least, better be equipped to deal with it. You are always the biggest priority. Self-care is essential to knowing yourself and managing your mental health, and that includes the people you surround yourself with. My therapist gave me a good example when explaining this to me, so I'm gonna use that example right now, and please just humor me for a moment. So, imagine that you are your own little personal ecosystem. There's fresh water and vibrant plants everywhere. There's a lot of animals, and it's a thriving ecosystem, and you are the one in charge of taking care of it. And someone else nearby you has their own little private bubble environment, and you two start sharing resources and helping each other out. And then they start dumping toxic waste into the water and leaving trash everywhere and the plants and animal life start slowly dying and everything is declining. So you bring this up to them. If their reaction turns out to be positive, such as, oh, I didn't know that was happening. I'm sorry, what can I do to fix this? Then it's a good sign. It shows that they're willing to work on themselves and you two can figure out how to repair the damage that's been done to the environment and figure out what to do in the future. If their reaction is to deny it and deflect it back on you and say, oh, well, this is your fault. This is your ecosystem, isn't it? It's not my problem, it's yours. Then that's not the best thing to have in your private little bubble. You're in charge of keeping your own little personal environment alive. And that environment is your mental health. Because no one else is going to take care of it for you. It's up to you to keep it alive and thriving. There are resources out there that you can contact if you need help getting out of these situations. The two numbers on the screen right here are 24-hour hotlines that are available to aid in these situations. Teen Lifeline is one that is run by teens most of the time and can help with any mental health issues. While the National Youth Crisis Hotline focuses a lot more on issues involving toxicity and social interactions. There are even crisis hotlines out there that are geared specifically towards abuse. And even if you can't reach out to these hotlines, you can reach out to adults you trust, teachers and coaches, guidance counselors at the school, your family if you, your family if you can, and if you want to see a licensed professional, you can as well. These are all good options. Toxic relationships are incredibly common among adolescents, and these adults are trained in dealing with them. At the end of the day, your mental health is what is most important, and you are never, ever alone. was a really informational speech and something that everyone should know. Our next speakers are Jake Digger and Charlie Feldstein, and they will be talking about how much you can trust modern baseball and the Mendoza line. Here's Charlie and Jake. Oh, just a moment. So, baseball. We all know it, some of us like it, some of us don't. Cool. There's two main statistics, or kinds of statistics in baseball, through which you can track individual performance, team performance, growth, failure, etc. The two stats, types of stats rather, are rate stats and counting stats. 
All right, so the first type of stats, rate stats. So here we have something just like a per unit or miles per gap. And in terms of baseball, we have batting average, which is the number of hits a hitter has divided by the total number of at-bats a hitter gets. At-bats are plate appearances, just whenever a hitter steps up to the plate, uh, minus walks. That gives you at-bats. And that is batting average, a stat that has really been used predominantly throughout baseball history. The other type of stats, counting stats, something uh, cumulative, just counting numbers, uh, like total miles driven. In baseball terms, as you can see, Barry Bonds majestically hitting a home run, just the number of home runs hit. Cool, so a very special counting statistic that has grown in popularity and fame over the past few years. It's a fairly recently created stat. So it's, you know, the tools for which to measuring it are fairly new because it uses a humongous amount of data. It's complex enough that my partner wrote his extended essay on it. It's Ooh. called OR. It stands for wins above replacement and it's exactly what it sounds like. If you take Joe Schmo off the street, you know, he's a replacement level player, which is, you know, Joe Schmo, average Joe, right? If you take him and compare it to someone in the major leagues, you're able to, through this statistic, measure their performance. You're able to see how many more, or less, wins they personally contributed to. And it's a highly complex pro process. Again, we'd be reading his entire extended essay and some if we were to try and describe it. But the gist is that it's wins above replacement, as we can see by this beautiful and large font table in the bottom right, the more war, the more wins you have, the better, which makes sense, because everyone wants wins, no one wants to lose. All right, so now to the title of our presentation, the Mendoza Line. What actually is the Mendoza Line? Well, the Mendoza Line is just a term for when a batter is batting an even 200, right on the top. It is named after a man named Mario Mendoza. As you can see in that little graph, his total batting average year by year in the blue hovers right around that red Mendoza line, right at 200. Most notably in his 1979 season, when he had over 400 play appearances, by far his most in his career, he batted 198 right near that Mendoza line. So now we know what the Mendoza line is. Well, is it good? Is it bad? Is it average? It's bad. It's very bad, sadly, for Mario Mendoza. Here we can see the league average batting average dating all the way back 100 years, and it maxes out at about 300 and is a minimum at around 230. And the mean is right about in the 260 range. So for a batter to bat only 200, well below even the minimum, is clearly not what you want. Cool, so now we talked about the Mendoza line. We know that it's really bad. So now we're going to talk about some, you know, some of the thought behind it. Who was Mario Mendoza, this good-looking Pirates baseball card we got on the right? Well, he played shortstop, which, for those who don't know baseball, he was closer to the pitcher than the back of the field, and that's all you need to know about shortstop. Uh, he spent nine years in the MLB. He played for the Pittsburgh Pirates, moved to the Seattle Mariners, and then finished his career with the Texas Rangers. And throughout those nine years, he only played one full season, his 1979 season, as Jake Cutter. That's the only year in which he got a consistent enough amount of plate appearances and enough at-bats throughout his year for the rate and counting stats to really have meaning. Because, you know, counting stats like home runs, they don't mean a whole lot if you only go to the plate once in a season, right? Cool, so why was Mario Mendoza? Which I think is an important question. Well, in his career, the counting stat war, you know, it measures how many wins you created, how many wins you contributed to compared to Joe Schmo. Well, he lost 2.7 games. Wow. He played in 686 in his career. He was paid at a professional baseball level for 686 games. And throughout all of those games, he lost 2.7, all on his own compared to Joe Schmo. So, in coining the term, uh, and now famous Hall of Famer George Brett, at the time a fellow player of Mario Mendoza, he was, you know, keeping track of Mendoza during his really, really poor 1979 full season. So he kind of joked, like, hey, let's call that the Mendoza line. He kind of laughed at himself. A newspaper picked it up. You'd think that that was, you'd think that that was all that came of the term. Turns out that was not the case. The Mendoza line became a phrase so ingrained in baseball 
It just started moving out of baseball into the world of economics and other things. It's now like a metaphor in its own right, which is terrifying for some, you know, relatively important baseball statistics, right? So you might be thinking, okay, this dude made most more than too many people over 686 games in nine years. Why the heck was this man in the MLB? Well, turns out that he was really good defensively. Now, shortstop, typically considered a really difficult position compared to some of the other ones, you have to be a really good defender in order to stay as a shortstop, at least historically, and he was. Here we have his D war, which is war, wins above replacement, except pretend he never picked up a bat. So he's only defensive, it's defensive, wins above replacement. His D war is four. So if he had religiously avoided bats for his entire career, which is impossible, but hey, if he never picked up a bat, he actually would have contributed to four wins, which really both highlights how good a defender he was and how awful of a batter he must have been if his overall war was negative 2.7. Not good. Okay, so now we have to ask our question. Did everything that we just talked about for the last few minutes matter at all? Well, that's a difficult question to answer. Uh, the Mendoza line is really, on its surface, just a term. It's just a term used, a dividing line, and on its own, it doesn't really have any meaning. However, especially in the 80s and 90s, it had a lot of influence on players in terms of contracts or awards they got, mostly because it was really just a, a stigma. It was, if you have a batter batting 195 versus a batter batting 205, the batter batting 195 was below the Mendoza line, and you just didn't want to be tagged with that. You didn't want to be the guy who was below the Mendoza line. And if you were below the Mendoza line, you really weren't going to get a lot of playing time, and you weren't going to get a lot of money. However, this stigma of batting average Mendoza line, it kind of started to fade in the last just 10 years or so, when more advanced statistics, like war, like Charlie explained, came along and were objectively just much better at evaluating how good a player was. They could tell the full story, whereas batting average really couldn't, it just wasn't that effective. So teams started seeing this and saying, well, wait a second, batting average doesn't really matter that much, we're not going to look at that, and we're not going to really care about it that much, so we're not going to care if a guy is batting below the nose line necessarily. We may still give him playing time. And this is, goes along with this graph perfectly, because before the Mendoza line, in the 60s and 70s, in those decades, there were each 11 players who had 400 plate appearances, so played pretty much the entire regular season, and batted below the Mendoza line. And out of those 22 players from those two decades, only eight of them had a positive war. So only eight really contributed anything to their team. So it makes sense, these players couldn't hit, they were below the Mendoza line, and the vast majority of them were bad, they hurt their team. And then in 1979, the Mendoza line was coined, and all of a sudden people didn't want to be below the Mendoza line, the coach didn't let people have 400 at-bats and be, the, be under the Mendoza line. So in the 80s, it almost halved, and just six players were below the Mendoza line for a full season. In the 90s, it halved again to just three, and in the 2000s, only one player got consistent playing time and finished below the Mendoza line. But then something changed, that those stigmas, they shifted, and just in the last decade, 19 players finished below the Mendoza line, yet had 400 plate appearances. And out of those 19 players, 12 of them had a positive war. So more players than ever were batting worse, but out of those players, they were actually contributing to their team in a positive light which is a very interesting trend. So I know what you're thinking. Jake, Charlie, you've wasted our time. Why are you standing in front of us and talking about something you're telling us doesn't matter? Why? Well, on its surface, maybe it's just a silly statistic. It's just batting 200, who cares? Well, it turns out that the rise and fall of the Mendoza line and this good-looking baseball player, the only good photo we could find of him, turns out that that actually does have some importance. It influenced the game of baseball for decades, and not only did it influence the game of baseball, but it was also indicative of the change that's taken place in baseball. As new statistics, as new coaching strategies are being developed every day and over the past few years, the Mendoza line has started to shift away from importance. 
the Mendoza line for years, indicative of just being really, really bad, and as a result, leading to garbage salaries or being cut altogether from the team. As more and more information regarding baseball, as more and more knowledge about the game, the science behind it comes out, the Mendoza line starts to not matter as much. And we think that is really beautiful. Thank you. and now not as influential. Um, we're going to introduce next, um, here, hold on, one second. Now next we have Caden Wime, if I'm pronouncing that right, um, and he's going to tell us about his wonderful idea um, for a more democratic school, if you'd like to come on up. Good evening, I hope you're all doing well uh, on this fine spring evening. Um, so, you will notice that I have not memorized my speech. So generally when politicians do have to memorize, do have to have their speeches memorized, uh, when they don't have their speeches memorized, they bring a teleprompter. I left mine at home. So, but honestly, my topic regards something that is happening in the moment, and things are changing so rapidly, and as such, this speech also has to change with those things. So. Um, I just had to write this thing three hours ago, actually, because that's when the last update happened. Um, anyways, let the presentation commence. So, in the enduring effort to provide an adequate education, a beneficial social construct, and the proper upbringing of future generations, this constitution is hereby ratified by the students of Desert Mountain High School. That was the preamble to the Desert Mountain High School constitution, which, as I speak, is being ratified in a school-wide referendum a referendum which would require over a thousand signatures to pass. So to understand how we got to where we are, we must delve into the multifaceted process of reform, even if it is on the school level. Well, we all have a role to play in bettering our society. My name is Ken Wime, and I believe in, uh, my, that I am myself best suited uh, for the political realm. And as such, I work to write and pass legislation that hopefully everyone can benefit from. And here at Desert Mountain, we have a student government, a government in which we can utilize to pass bills that institute a plethora of initiatives, from increasing our school sustainability, to reducing discrimination and drug use, and revitalizing the school's nutrition program. So that's exactly what I did. Soon a motion that I called the Instant Action Plan was drafted, and this proposition was not one bill, but rather a collective of bills, bound together by a common purpose, to get the school back on its feet, after the COVID-19 pandemic and aid students in the transition process. But here's the thing. I wanted to get this passed by the Desert Mountain student government, and our student government, frankly, did not have the structure or the capability to pass these initiatives. You see, it is my belief that the student government has been largely ineffective because they do not even know what they can do. I mean, yes, they can pass budget proposals and plan events and all, but what can they actually do? As a member of the student government, I was shocked that we actually did not have any ideas to how far our capabilities extended. We didn't have a charter or an organizational document. So my pursuit was centered around solidifying the student government's role in our school, and to do that, we needed a student constitution. So I began writing. I had spring break to do this, and I was able to contribute long hours and sleepless nights to writing, and writing until the first draft of this constitution was complete. The Constitution had amassed over 50 pages, which I was able to reduce down to 30, but then came the tedious process of editing it word for word, checking grammar, tightening loopholes, and going through the school's code of conduct to ensure there was no conflict. Eventually, after many arduous cycles of editing, came this, this document that somehow was supposed to change our school. Somehow, these 30 pages are supposed to make our school a more democratic and representative environment for our students that favors the opinions of the student body, and somehow my dreams of making our school a better place had come down to this. Now, here's the important thing to remember is that this constitution does not actually solve the drug problem in our school, nor does it fix the broken nutrition system, but rather it gives the student government the platform for which to pass legislation to take initiatives on these matters. And this went from one simple proposition to a full-on constitution. I was not expecting a constitution, but nonetheless, I got one. Uh, and hopefully this constitution succeeds in providing the students of Desert Mountain with a much needed voice. 
How does it do this? Well, the Constitution plans on reforming our school by having each classroom elect one senator, which would uh, represent the individuals in that classroom. These hundred or so senators would convene once every month with the members of the student government, and they would vote on legislation, budget proposals, and any other motions. The student senate would allow for students to speak with peers that they did not have, uh, that they would know and feel comfortable around. They would be able to speak about school issues, and they can provide the student government with the necessary information to better understand the problems and possible solutions for our school. Now, these student senators can be anyone. They can be that one student eager to share his opinion with the school, that one student that wants to see change in her classroom, or that one student who knows that together we can make a difference. The student senators would be the symbol of how things are going to change in our school. They are going to show us that we can, through the power of the democratic process, achieve new heights at the school level. The student constitution plans to better regulate clubs and ensure that funds are being spent efficiently. It also intends to better facilitate communication between students and administration. So armed, and, and the last major initiative that the student constitution takes is provides a backbone for the student government to center its operations off of, uh, thus allowing it to operate more efficiently and effectively. So armed with the premonition of ensured ratification, I pitched the idea of this constitution to the student government. Coming into this, I was quite hopeful. I guess I was under the impression that the constitution would be ratified with little to no resistance. I mean, who does not want a more representative student body? But I was wrong in my belief. I, I guess I could say that I was a bit naive. The student government was particularly opposed to the student senate, as they believed that one, uh, as one member stated, it was, quote, too democratic. Uh, others argued that having to wrangle 100 student senators would be quite difficult. But if the two-year-olds on Capitol Hill could do it, so could we. Okay, so it was clear to, uh, it was clear that speaking to the student government didn't really work. Uh, if, if we wanted to pass this constitution and ratify it, then it was apparent that we would have to speak to those whom it directly affected, thus the student body. We decided to form a petition to gauge whether the student body would be interested in having a constitution that would hopefully provide them with more representation and more of a say on school matters. Now, here are the rules for conducting a petition as per the Constitution. For the Constitution to be submitted for a school-wide referendum, it would need to have the signatures of 10% of the student body, which at this moment is approximately 200 students. So we have our work cut out for us. Uh, and last week, as in-person students and staff will remember, uh, I was scrambling around campus, uh, clipboard in hand, having any interested students sign the petition. And within 48 hours, we were able to achieve the requisite 200 signatures. And with that, the Constitution proceeded to a school-wide referendum. Getting 200 signatures was easy. Getting over half of the school to approve this Constitution on the referendum, not so much. But thankfully, a group of willing student volunteers, both online and in person, worked to make sure that every student had the ability to vote in this school-wide referendum. Within two days, we were nearing 400 votes in favor of the Constitution. And even now, votes are still coming in, little by little, but nonetheless, still helping the effort to reach that 1,000 vote goal. When this gets ratified, hopefully, we will be able to do so much more for the student body. I revel in seeing students be able to express themselves and take initiatives to show that students can work to change their school. Through this Constitution, we can give that opportunity to students, and it really gives me so much hope and happiness. The very reason that this Constitution has been created is because we, the youth, should not be an afterthought in the minds of our leaders. Rather, we are the future, so we better start being proactive to prepare for it. This Constitution has been drafted because we see the state of our schools, and we see the state of other schools, and we, we uh, need ourselves to be an example, to, be, to set a precedent to show people that we can create an environment that fosters new ideas and allows for our students to grow and shape the future in a positive manner. And while, yes, we are constricted by the bounds placed upon us by the public education system, we still want ourselves, we still need ourselves to inspire action and reform for schools across the nation and around the globe. We need a school that allows creativity and places more power in the hands of students who can better understand us. And with the passage of this Constitution, we can work to build an environment that we can feel safe and secure in, an environment that facilitates hope and inspiration, that helps us become better students and better citizens. Let's work together to achieve that goal. Let's work together to ratify this Constitution. So thank you, and God bless you. Um, and we've kind of 
might want to go through and thank a few people. Yeah, so the. Oh gosh. Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Thank you guys. Yeah. Yeah.